Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this panel discussion launching the paper on climate change migration and vulnerability to trafficking. The international community is now increasingly recognising that environmental de degradation and climate change could potentially result in the displacement of people at an alarming, uh, to an alarming rate. The latest IPCC report noted that the greatest single impact of climate change could be on human migration. And the issue is that we're not equipped to address this issue in an effective manner. We do not have adequate policy planning and response frameworks in place to deal with it. And leaving this issue unattended is resulting in dangerous consequences of trafficking and different forms of exploitative working conditions and net bondage for the people in marginalised. To date, the issues of climate-induced migration have largely remained on the sidelines of international discourse on climate. And although some action has been taken, but they, um, they're largely reactive by responding to the humanitarian crises and by assisting developing countries after disaster strikes. So in the absence of preventative measures, the future for many developing countries and their vulnerable communities is likely to be to remain on the continuum of widespread land degradation, food insecurity, forced migration and exposure to trafficking. Migration and relocation are often viewed as last resort options by policymakers, but not, nevertheless, we, we do need to be giving them adequate attention with rehabilitation and recovery mechanisms in place and promoting sustainable livelihoods um, as, as these climates are shifting. So relocation programmes, rather than being a quick fix option, are um, long-term challenging solutions, um, but, are, but are definitely require to strengthen livelihoods, build resilience, and improve the living standards of those affected, and reinvigorate communities' um, environments. So proactive intervention is now essential. At IID, our work on social protection and on the uh, loss and damage we're co-developing solutions with vulnerable country representatives to explore how early action through government plan support can help households move out of harm's way. And government um, uh, supported relocation as a post-disaster response strategy, as well as supporting voluntary migration by household or individuals where they're moving towards opportunity um, as an adaptation or risk minimization strategy. We have some good examples. The Uruguay National Resettlement Plan has been hailed as a lighthouse relocation initiative that is um, aiming to support um, thousands of households um, move out of flood prone areas and into secure housing um, on safe lands. At IID, we're committed to work with our partners to, to really think through this, this, these types of solutions so they're fair and equitable and combine the appropriate support for adaptation for the, um, the, for the very poorest and most vulnerable through early action. We've partnered with grassroots organizations like PHIA Foundation and Aid et Action, along with um, Anti-Slavery International, who are equally committed to addressing these issues in a holistic manner. And we're particularly thankful to the UK government's um, FCDO for their support and funding, which enabled us to carry out this research. The issue of climate change induced migrant and displacement is, and its nexus with slavery is high on our agenda and will continue to raise this issue at the relevant fora of national and international policy discourse and um, drawing on this evidence and research from the ground. This year is also 50 years um, since IID was established and I can assure you we'll continue to work hard hand in hand with vulnerable countries and communities to help them address the challenges of climate crisis. So I'd like to once again welcome and thank our keynote speakers, moderator, panellists, and close to 400 participants have registered to join um, this event. We're humbled and at the same time enthused by your support and can assure you we'll continue to work on this issue and, and um, uh, along with the local, national and international partners to drive this policy discourse. I'd now like to welcome Catherine Turner, the Head of Programmes and Advocacy from Anti-Slavery International, with whom I'm co-moderating this session to say a few words. Catherine. Thanks so much, Claire, and thank you um, to IRED for inviting Anti-Slavery to speak today. Um, Jasmine O'Connor, our CEO, sends her apologies as she's unwell, unfortunately, but I'm delighted to be here instead um, to celebrate the launch of another important report from IRED. Um, Anti-Slavery International has been campaigning for over 180 years for people to experience a life free from slavery and exploitation. Slavery thrives where weak rule of law meets discrimination and poverty and catastrophic events can heighten this. 
Today, there are more than 40 million people in modern slavery, and the World Bank recently estimated that by 2050, over 200 million people might be forced to migrate as a result of climate change. As climate change threatens the very foundations of our society, we are beginning to see that the heightened vulnerabilities people experience when they face losing their livelihoods and contemplate migration make them even more at risk of exploitation and slavery. We are proud, therefore, that our partnership with IIED has brought two vitally important and relevant sectors together, combining our expertise to shine a light on the true human cost of climate change. IED's latest report highlights this nexus and draws on our shared research from last year, which showed how two geographic locations that experienced climate change in different ways, both slow and rapid onset, nevertheless reached the same conclusion about the heightened vulnerability to slavery. This in turn built on an important piece of research that Anti-Slavery International published by Dr. Chris O'Connell of Dublin City University that initially drew attention to the nexus between climate change and modern slavery. This newly launched report from IIED reinforces our conclusions. It is now clear that climate change must be acknowledged and properly recognised as a driver of modern slavery. However, policymakers and governments are not recognising this yet. While it is widely acknowledged that climate change forces migration, the resulting heightened risk of human trafficking and slavery is ignored. This report brings in further rigorous, rigorous evidence that must be acted upon. It calls for this nexus between modern slavery and climate change to be recognised in the national and international climate change mechanisms and for investment in resources to build an evidence base on the best ways to prevent and respond to this injustice. By being led by those based in the countries of highest risk, elevating the voices of those who are or have experienced it and working with new allies, we are working to prevent people being forced into modern slavery as a result of climate change. Anti-Slavery International will continue to work to realize freedom from slavery for everyone, everywhere, always. So it's now my pleasure to invite Sally Taylor uh, to give the welcome address. Sally has previously worked as head of the UK's Department for International Development in Sierra Leone and Ghana. She is currently the Director of Development, Climate Science and Technology at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. So I'd like to welcome Sally. Thanks very much, Catherine. And it's really a pleasure to be here and to see everybody and to, you know, and to welcome you all to the launch of this, um, this report that we've commissioned. I want to thank the research partners, IAD and DIA, AD Action, who conducted this work. We think it's a really great piece of work and provides really compelling evidence on the links between climate change, migration, human trafficking, and helps us to really think about what we can do about, about these issues. So as Claire and Catherine have already said, you know, climate change is happening. It's causing a lot of effects and impacts for, for vulnerable people, for poor people across the world. And you know, helping to address the, the impacts of climate change is a really central part of the UK's climate work. Our aim really is to help drive and accelerate the systemic shifts that we, we all need to make to achieve the Paris Agreement goals and that are captured in the Glasgow Climate Pact. And as those of us on this call, I'm sure know very well that one of the four priorities on that, on the, in the pact is to uh, really accelerate and uh, get more ambition around adaptation, loss and damage, including more finance. So we were really keen to sort of make this a priority in Glasgow and to and to gain new agreements to take more action, give this more priority. And really targeting sort of our efforts towards the needs of people who face the consequences of climate change is really critical. There's lots of ways of doing this through expanding insurance, social protection coverage, investment in early action and early warning. You know, these are some of the ways in which we can help people to think about you know, how and, and to be able to manage the shocks and stresses that they face from climate change and to help reduce distress migration. And the climate, so the Glasgow Climate Pact also really recognised the importance of science, the importance of science to 
um, for generating knowledge and to be embedded into decision making. So research is really critical and it's something that the UK has really invested in as part of our contribution to help tackling climate change and to improve our, our development efforts. You know, really helping policy makers, decision makers to better understand climate impacts and shocks and how we can really make it do better to address them. So we've supported several pieces of, of research that are to try to sort of contribute to getting a better, deeper understanding of the underlying drivers of migration, you know, its patterns, its consequences, and what's the best way of helping communities to build their resilience. And that's true also here in India. So I'm based here in, in Delhi, and we really recognize that climate adaptation, helping to think about the way in which climate will play out in India is going to be very important for India's sustained development and its sort of focus area for our work here. So we're really keen to support India's efforts to ensure that communities, particularly marginalised groups, can adapt to the worst effects of climate change. And we've been working, for example, with India's very large social protection scheme, the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Scheme. And that has you know, enormous potential and capacity to really help poor people to cope with climate change. It's got this huge reach and scale that really has, has the potential to help people make, to be safer from climate disasters. And it was our engagement in that scheme that really led to this research. We could see distress migration happening. We could see the displacement that came from both rapid and slow onset sort of shocks and stresses and realised there was a sort of lack of data, lack of knowledge about what was happening, how big it, how, you know, what scale, what the implications were. And it was you know, the risks of it leading to the trafficking of vulnerable people. So uh, we work with colleagues in our South Asia Research Hub who do a lot of work to really support cutting edge knowledge and to promote its use and commission this work to, to give us some you know, better assessment of the extent of and impact of climate change on these issues, on migration, on human trafficking, and looking at that into particularly migration prone areas to see what was happening. So as I say, we're really pleased with the quality of this work carried out. Um, we're really excited that we're all here to sort of hear the findings of this to better understand these issues and to really think about you know, how we can use this information to improve our efforts to help tackle climate change and to achieve the sustainable development goals. So you're all very welcome. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Sally. Um, wonderful to see you again and delighted you're now in India and able to champion these issues. Um, I'd now like to welcome Siobhan Mulali, the UN Special Rapporteur on Trafficking in Persons, especially Women and Children, appointed by the Human Rights Council in August 2020. She's also the Established Professor of Human Rights Law and Director of the Irish Centre of Human Rights School of Law, University of Galway, and is a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague. She was previously president of the Council of Europe Group of Experts on Action Against Trafficking in Persons and has worked with UN entities and international NGOs in many parts of the world. Please, Siobhan. Thank you very much and thank you very much to IIED for the opportunity to participate here today and um, to have had the opportunity to read and comment on the report that has been launched. Um, this is a thematic priority for my mandate uh, as UN Special Rapporteur on Trafficking in Persons. I'm particularly keen to address the risks of trafficking in persons that arise from uh, forced migration and displacement linked to climate change, as well as to look at those sectors that may be contributing negatively to climate change um, because of their activities such as intensive agriculture, fisheries, extractive mining, etc. Um, my upcoming report to the Human Rights Council, which will be launched 
on the 21st of June and presented to the UN Human Rights Council looks at trafficking in persons in the agriculture sector. And I've had the opportunity to benefit from the work of IIED in preparing that report, which also highlights uh, the risks of trafficking in persons arising from loss of livelihoods uh, due to intensive agriculture practices, sudden onset disasters, as well as slow onset uh, climate change impacts. And my forthcoming report to the UN General Assembly uh, in October this year will focus specifically on the intersections of trafficking in persons and climate change. So I'm particularly pleased um, to have had the opportunity to read this report and the analysis and recommendations. Um, just last week, I attended and participated in the International Migration Review Forum in New York, uh, which was looking at four years of the implementation of the Global Compact on Migration for safe, orderly and regular migration. And as you know, objective two of the Global Compact looks in particular at migration arising from disasters and climate change. And the progress declaration adopted at the end of the week, again, commits to expanding pathways for safe and regular migration uh, for those who are displaced as a result of climate change. And that is critical to the prevention of trafficking in persons for all purposes of exploitation. And this report, I think, is particularly important because it's helping us to build an evidence base uh, the empirical studies, the evidence gathered from Palamu and Kendrapara, the two areas that are studied and analysed here in the report, are really important in terms of bringing to the fore concrete empirical information around the impact of climate change and the increasing vulnerability to trafficking arising from gaps in social protection, loss of livelihoods or reduction in incomes, and displacement linked uh, to those developments. And again, I think what is, is really important in the report is the analysis of the differences that arise in the two areas. Um, for example, given the greater attention that we see globally to rapid onset events uh, and their impacts, climate extremes. And so more attention, for example, perhaps being given to the kinds of impacts endured by Kendra Para, uh, as compared to Palamu, where we see studied in the report, the impact of slow onset events and lesser attention being given um, to the consequences of that in terms of loss of livelihoods and displacement. Also important in the report is the attention given to socioeconomic factors and political factors and the impact of, uh, of discrimination on particular groups. For example, with regard to the particular risks faced as a result of discrimination against those who are members of scheduled tribes or caste-based discrimination, that that exacerbates vulnerabilities to, to, to trafficking. And because of that societal community um, discrimination endured uh, for many years. So all of those combine to increase the risks. And importantly here, I think there's also attention to the gender dimension of trafficking. Uh, and my um, mandate as Special Rapporteur has a particular focus on women and children, but it is important to note that it is gender inclusive. It includes particular risks that may be faced by LGBT persons, persons of diverse gender identities, as well as by men and boys. And I think it's important here that we recognize the need for gender, gender sensitivity in responses and the broader gender dimensions, that women may be particularly impacted because they have less control over natural resources, um, because of gender inequality in terms of land and property rights, and that those exacerbate the vulnerabilities that arise because of that inequality. Importantly here in the report, um, and I hope that I can continue to work with you to, to achieve these recommendations, is the attention to the need for greater coordination 
between all of the different actors and programs responding to climate change and to the climate crisis, that we need to move beyond fragmented approaches and silo approaches, um, that when we think about climate justice, when we think about just transitions, um, that we are also paying attention to the importance of a human rights-based approach to migration and displacement. And that informs our work to prevent trafficking in persons first and foremost, uh, and to ensure effective access to protection for those at risk of trafficking or those who are victims of trafficking. So again, to conclude, um, I very much welcome the publication of the report. Congratulations to all of those involved. I look forward to hearing the rest of the contributions today. And I hope that I can continue to work with you um, jointly, as I said, to, to implement uh, and give effect to these recommendations that we work with all of the different um, platforms working on climate change, on disaster responses, as well as on human trafficking and contemporary forms of slavery. Uh, and that in that way, we can strengthen the impact of our actions. Thank you again. Thanks, Siobhan, for your informative contribution. Um, I'd like now to welcome our second keynote speaker, Cecilia Silva Bernardo, who is the Director for Cooperation at the Ministry of Culture, Tourism and the Environment in the Republic of Angola, and is one of the lead negotiators for the least developed countries under the UNFCCC process. She was previously the co-chair of the Adaptation Committee of the UNFCCC and is a member of the committee since 2016, representing the least developed countries. Thank you very much, Catherine, and thank you all the organizers for inviting me to be part of this important event. Um, as we all can feel, climate change is the defining crisis of our time and the stress, migration and disaster displacement one of its most devastating consequences. Every part of the world is already suffering the impacts, but vulnerable people living in some of the least developed and conflict-affected countries are more disproportionately affected. At COP26, we were hoping that all parties will work together to deliver on securing a global net zero target, mobilizing finance for vulnerable developing countries and supporting them to undertake adaptation measures to protect communities and natural, natural habitats. But we are far from realization of these ambitions. Furthermore, the developed countries are shrugging off their responsibility. So far, they have not even met their commitment of 100 billion target of climate finance support, let alone the fact that a very minuscule amount of what they are providing as climate finance is available for climate adaptation that can help the communities better prepare or cope with climate impacts. The impacts of climate change are numerous and trigger both displacement and worse in living conditions or hamper return for those who have already been displaced. Limited natural resources such as drinking water, food and food suppliers, are becoming even more scarce in many parts of the world. Crops and life, life, livestock struggle to survive where conditions become too hot and dry or too cold and wet, threatening livelihoods. In such conditions, climate change can act as a threat multiplier, exacerbating existing vulnerabilities, pushing people into despair and adding to their probability of landing in trafficking, forced or exploitative work conditions. Compounding the challenges of climate change are the recent dramatic trends in soaring food and fuel prices, which are poised to have a major impact on hunger and poverty in the developing world and have an immediate impact on our ability to deal with the worsening climate impacts. Hazards resulting from the increasing intensity and frequency of extreme weather events, such as abnormally heavy rainfall, prolonged droughts, desertification, environmental degradation, 
or sea level rise and cyclones are already causing an average of more than 20 million people to leave their homes and move to other areas in their countries each year. Some people are forced to cross borders in the context of climate change and disasters. We are currently seeing millions of people being forced to flee Ukraine. But if we compare that with no of climate in induced migrants, that we can expect in years to come, it would be many folds higher than this number. Refugees internally displaced people and stateless are on the front lines of the climate emergency. Many are living in climate hotspots where they typically lack the resources to adapt in new environment they move to. Supporting countries facing increase, increased climate impacts and distress migrants as a result of it is a matter of climate justice and solidarity, especially in context of vulnerability it creates to trafficking. Despite the serious development and humanitarian implications of large-scale forced climate migration, the interest of international stakeholders in dealing with this is limited. Bold speeches and elaborate commitments to pursue noble goals like climate change, sustainable de development, safe migration, typically fall prey to narrow geopolitical interests when the time for action comes. The result, the result is that forced climate migrants fall through the cracks and exposed of the vulnerability of trafficking. We all need to realize that climate crisis is a human crisis. It is driving displacement and making life harder for those forced to leave their homes. In absence of any support, they are pushed to pursue risky coping strategies that exposes them to trafficking and slavery-like situations. There is an urgent need to combat the growing and disproportionate impacts of the climate emergency on the most vulnerable countries and communities, in particular those displaced and pushed to undertake distress migration and to support vulnerable countries and communities in their efforts to rapidly scale up prevention and preparedness measures to avert, minimize, and address displacement and distress migration. Time is running out. We can no longer afford to underestimate the disaster taking place before our eyes around the world we have to ask the question, are we properly prepared for this? We can create solutions to tackle this issue of climate migration and trafficking, but it, it is going to take all of our combined efforts to prepare for and address it in a holistic manner. I thank you very much and congratulations for the publication of the report. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Um, it's always a pleasure to hear from you. And as you say, distress migration is such a challenging issue for the most vulnerable countries and communities like the LDCs, the least developed countries. And as you've so eloquently said, time is indeed running out. So it is now my pleasure to introduce the moderator for the panel discussion, Josh Mayer. Um, Josh is the security correspondent at USA Today. He reports on trafficking, counter narcotics, organized crime, corruption, among a host of other issues. Previously, while working at the Times, he's been recognised for his investigative reporting with numerous awards at the paper, including two Pulitzer Prizes and an Overseas Press Club Award. Over to you, Josh, for taking forward the panel discussion. Thank you very much for, um, for having me. Um, so uh, I was honoured to lead an investigative uh, reporting project uh, on the security threats posed by climate change worldwide and how they loomed particularly large for people in Bangladesh and India and the region. And during the, the next two generations, uh, experts that we just, we talked to, including government officials around the world, said that these problems are likely to grow worse if climate change, as predicted, raises sea levels and temperatures and affects weather and other factors. 
Uh, by 2050, uh, we reported rising oceans were projected to cost low-lying countries 17 to 20 percent of its land mass. That was going to render at least 20 million people homeless, ruin food production of rice and wheat and other key uh, commodities, um, and have other devastating effects. And the reason I mention this is uh, we, uh, and, and particularly why I mention it in the context of this excellent new report by IIED, um, is that our project was done 12 years ago, uh, back in 2010, uh, and things have not improved in the last decade. In fact, they've worsened, they've gotten a lot worse, uh, both in terms of what's happening on the ground, uh, but also in the acceleration of the projections of how things are going to get worse in the future. Um, over the past decade, there's been growing awareness of the security risks posed by climate change, of course. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's received, uh, it has not received the attention uh, and priority that it needs to receive from policymakers uh, in any particular country, especially here in the United States, of course, uh, but also from the international community. So uh, I am honored to be here to moderate this webinar and to discuss this new and groundbreaking report that details the extent and the impact of climate change uh, on distress migration and uh, human trafficking. Uh, it'll be interesting and I believe very, very newsworthy uh, to discuss these findings from the research that explores the nexus between climate change, migration, and vulnerability to trafficking. So as the moderator, I will save the details for the experts um, my, my role here is to stay out of their way and help keep things running along. Uh, but to briefly summarize, the new report from IIED and its key partners um, is among the first to provide an empirical and compelling body of evidence uh, on the links between climate change, migration, and trafficking. Um, and it's in very easily understandable analysis, even to a journal for a journalist like myself, uh, it, it really unpacks the underlying drivers that should be targeted by policymakers um, uh, and needed to deal with this nexus. Uh, I was particularly uh, impressed by the uh, how the report provides the extent and impact of climate change on distress migration and human trafficking um, in two diverse areas, uh, slow onset and rapid onset climatic events. Uh, and a particular note, and I'll end with this, People migrating to escape slow onset climate disasters like drought are two and a half times more likely to experience trafficking uh, or modern slavery than those people fleeing rapid onset disasters like floods or cyclones, um, according to the new research um, here by the Inst International Institute for Environment and Development. Um, in particular, India and Pakistan uh, and the region have been experiencing record heat in the last few months which of course is helping draw attention to the problem, but making it, it worse. So with that, I would like to um, uh, introduce uh, the panelists. Um, uh, Ritu Bharadwaj, of course, senior researcher at the Climate Change Group for International Institute for Environment and Development. Uh, Johnson Topno, uh, regional head of programs uh, and uh, for Partnering Hope into Action or PHIA Foundation, Umi Daniel, uh, Director of Migration and, and Education for Aid and Action in South Asia, and Devanshu Chakravarti, uh, a researcher and independent consultant. So first, I would like to invite uh, Mamta Kohli, uh, Senior Social Development Advisor uh, for the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office in the UK, to share some opening thoughts on this issue um, before we move into the panel discussion. So thank you for having me. Um, thank you, Josh, uh, and thank you, IID, for hosting this. Um, I think our speakers before me have covered, uh, you know, has give, have given you the gist of what I'm dealing with and what the report really talks about. I just wanted to reflect on a couple of key takeaways for me as someone who's been working in this area um, on social development issues and on human trafficking for a while. What were my key takeaways that were sort of reaffirmed but also new insights? Um, so the first was around vulnerabilities. Um, the need to understand the deep structural inequalities that exist and how they play out and how they get even more accentuated uh, because of climate change. 
um, and and vulnerabilities of people who move and people who stay behind. So I think uh, our ability to understand and to see how these, these uh, climate change impacts these two different groups differently. I think my second um, insight for me was the impact of slow onset, which we've seen on the ground ourselves when we're going to the same village over and over the years and seeing how people have been moving out, how fields have been drying up. But I think, uh, so this report has also taught us how to link different, uh, to be able to see the big picture together. So I think this, this is a great um, insight for me personally to understand why these shifts are happening. Why are the fields drying up? Why is the water table really going so low? And what is it that the policy uh, environment can really do about it? Uh, my third is, of course, that how you need to bring your understanding, our understanding of climate change and inequality together to frame the social protection or any other kind of government outreach or programs uh, that are out there. It's easy. It just requires us to really give it a little bit more thinking, a little bit more nuanced understanding. And I think this report um, is, is important. Uh, also in the context of uh, all the conversations recently we've been having around climate change, COP26 really, really brought the issue into the limelight. And like everybody said, the heat we've been experiencing in India has again brought it home that climate change is very real. It's not just about two degrees here and there, but it affects our everyday lives very, very deeply. So why do I think the report is also important? Because we've made commitments, the world has made commitments around loss and damages, about adaptation and resilience, have made uh, commitments around locally led solutions. And what this report helps us is to really understand the local context very well. Because if we don't, if we don't understand who's being affected and how and how they're responding and what's happening to them and how they can be helped, um, our, our, uh, we'll just remain at a very rhetoric and a very, uh, you know, at a very general level. So this report actually helps us get into the granularity of it and to understand how different uh, events impact uh, people differently, and different geographies and how it how it builds on their underlying vulnerabilities. Finally, I think it's also important that an institution like IIED is taking it up, a core climate uh, environment think tank, uh, which again signals how people are beginning to look at issues in a connected way. And I think uh, that's really important. Um, it's really important because communities don't exist in silos. They don't respond to various issues in silos. Um, and you'll get more, far more insights than I'm speaking from the great panel that uh, we have. People who have actually worked on the study have collected data and have gone out to the field. I accompanied them on a couple of this thing, but uh, really uh, heart-wrenching deep stories, but also a lot of lessons in terms of what are some of the good things that then come out of it and how do we mitigate the risks. So uh, thank you, Josh. That's it from me. And over to the panel for uh, what I hope will be an interesting conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to introduce, uh, reintroduce Ritu, uh, who of course is the senior researcher uh, for the climate change group at IIED um, and a, a big driver, of course, of this report. Uh, Ritu, uh, the first question I think would be, what are the links between climate change, migration, and trafficking? Uh, tell us about the findings of your research uh, on the levels of climate vu vulnerability, uh, the trends of distress migration uh, due to climate impacts, and the extent of human trafficking induced due to climate impacts. Uh, thank you so much, Josh. And just for the interest of all the participants as well, I'll just provide a small background about our program. So um, in our research, we tried to unpack the nexus between climate change, migration, and trafficking in two contrasting geographies. One that is facing slow onset event like drought. And for that, we picked up Palamo district in Jharkhand. And second, an area facing sudden onset climatic disasters like floods and cyclone. And for that, we picked up Kendrapara district in Odisha. And the reason for picking up two different geographies was to understand how and to what extent both slow and sudden onset events are different in terms of creating vulnerability to trafficking. What are the underlying drivers that are creating push and pull towards risky migration pathways? And finally, the gaps in the existing social protection program 
and how they fail to provide safety net to communities that are exposed to climate crisis. And we did that because we felt that a better understanding of these issues can provide an insight into strengthening the existing policy response framework to supporting anti-trafficking efforts in context of climate change. So now actually going on to your question, uh, Josh. So coming to findings, for us, the most startling finding was the extent to which trafficking in the two areas differed. Trafficking in the drought area uh, was almost two and a half to three times more than that in the flood and cyclone affected area. So the percentage of traffic migrants in Palamu, which is a drought affected area, was 42% compared to 16% in Kendrapada, impacted by flood and cyclone. So by no means I'm saying that 16% is less, even 16% is a big number. But 42% is a number that should really raise a red flag for everyone. Now, these trafficked uh, migrants uh, face slavery-like situations such as forced labor, bonded labor, debt bondage, wage withholding, and exploitative working conditions. Now, the dramatic difference in the extent to which these two locations um, are, are facing trafficking is because the current policy response tends to focus on impacts of sudden onset disaster that usually makes national headline rather than the consequences of slow disasters like drought. Now, Palamu suffers from drought and does not get the same level of attention as flood and cyclone affected area. Now, drought almost in many sense acts like an invisible slow poison rendering people gradually into a state of utter despair and helplessness. Now, surprisingly, one would, you know, it's surprising to know that there's no drought early warning system in India to provide anticipatory support to communities exposed to it. Further, even after the drought occurs, like you're not even talking about early warning, even after the drought occurs, there's a lot of political economy around its declaration. Now, only a drought of a severe category is entitled to get relief from the central government. So many state governments, they wait until the drought moves from moderate to severe category. As a result, many droughts either go unreported or declared so late that the communities are forced into distress migration to survive and feed their families. Now, in case of flood or cyclone, there are fairly well-developed early warning system where communities are at least moved to safety before the event. I'm not saying everything is glorious and nice in the flood and cyclone affected area. You'll hear Daniel more about it. But beyond this, the so beyond this early warning and uh, a declaration of drought and other factors, the underlying social and class divide in poverty and marginalization, they also tend to compound the factors along with climate impacts leading to trafficking. For example, in Palamo, uh, there is a huge social class divide and economic disparity. Now, the upper caste Brahmins are economically better off and control most of the land in that area, as well as the political institutions. And lower caste Harijans are mostly landless and poor. Now, recurring crop losses lead them into debt bondage and possession of their farmlands, in most of the cases we saw, was taken away by Brahmin landlords. Now, as agriculture is becoming less viable uh, due to climate impacts, even for those landlords who now have control of the lands, they are now giving it away to brick kiln owners. Now, when we went uh, to the research area, we saw there were 17 brick kilns in the vicinity of the research village. Now, crop loss due to climate forces, uh, distress migration leading for family background, and while men move away in search of work, women and girls as young as 16, 17 year old, they work in these brick kilns to make ends meet. And if anyone has ever been to a brick kiln, you can see, you even if you're wearing your shoe and, and, and sandals, you'll see them virtually melting. It's so hot and it's so difficult to work in those areas. But, you know, desperate to find work, these men and women have very little bargaining power, making them vulnerable to trafficking, you know, so they're even willing. So they're mostly taken out by this, of, the, of the state by the contractors and employed in life-threatening work. And there are also often a lot of deaths which are reported, but in most cases, contractors don't even inform the families to avoid paying compensation for the accidental death. Now, many individuals from the village have been missing for months, and sometimes returning workers tell families that their relatives have died, 
But in, even in those cases, the bodies are never brought back. So going beyond the trafficking, if you look in terms of migration trend and how much it gets impacted by climate change, of course, the underlying factors as well. But overall, about 85% of the respondent had at least one family member migrating. And more than 50% of the respondents said that the climate and environmental stressors have become more hazardous and frequent in the last 10 years, leading to crop failure, livestock mortality, and destruction of houses. Now, Odisha coast used to get one cyclone in two years. Now they get two cyclones in the year. So you can imagine the way in which the frequency and intensity of these events are increasing. Similarly, in Jharkhand, food and water scarcity is becoming a major issue um, uh, because of the long dry spells and droughts. So, and all this is pushing them towards distress migration. There's help, they, helplessness and despair due to these events is such that even if they know that there's danger or risk involved, in the jobs that they're going to take up in the destination site, they still take it up. And I remember having talked to one of the respondents in, in one of the village, and he said to me that when we go out to work, sometimes we come back and sometimes our bodies. And we are always under surveillance and fear and survive at the mercy of the contractors. We also found that the existing social protection schemes like MGNR EGS, which has been mentioned by speakers before me, and health facilities, midday meal scheme, et cetera, are not effective and are inadequate in addressing vulnerabilities in the face of climate and environmental crisis. So typically, you would imagine that when vulnerable communities are faced with climate impacts, uh, they should be protected by some social safety net. But when they don't have access to shelter, food, decent job, healthcare, they, they become exposed to exploitation. And we, in the research area, in both the areas, I would say, we found that the coverage of most social protection program was way low. The job card coverage under the NREC schemes that provides employment during climate crisis was found to be low in both locations. So in Kendrapada, only 33%, and in Palamu, around 42%. And this is when the scheme provides legal entitlement to every rural household to demand 100 days of employment during crisis. And if they are not provided that, they are entitled to an unemployment allowance. But still, this, this program is not effective because people don't have access to it. Now, these schemes also do not have the provision of targeting migrants, especially as there is no portability of entitlements under these schemes. So when people are forced to leave their native village, these safety nets don't are not available to them when they are on way or at the destination site. So this in, you know, this in on the whole are, is our key findings. And in the end, I would only say, Josh, that, that evidence from the research shows that climate change is worsening poverty and inequality and pe placing people who are already in precarious situation in position where they leave, reach their limits of coping capacity and are exposed to trafficking. Thank you. That was excellent, um, as expected. So I really uh, I appreciate that overview. Uh, we're next going to go to Umi Daniel, the Director of Migration and Education um, for Aid at Action um, in South Asia and India. And um, uh, Umi, we just heard the findings from the research and your organization um, works with vulnerable migrant communities in Odisha. Uh, can you explain how communities are coping with rapid onset disasters like floods and cyclones and how that is driving distress migration uh, and creating uh, vulnerability to trafficking. Thank you, Josh. Uh, good morning uh, and good afternoon to uh, everyone who have joined this wonderful conversation. Uh, yes, we have been working uh, for a very long time with uh, migrant communities in different uh, places. Uh, uh, and both at source and destination. Uh, we work with children, we work with uh, infant. And what we have seen, I think the situation before the uh, COVID and situation before, after the COVID, uh, the pandemic, it has changed the lives of people. Uh, and also like, you know, the, the treasury is much more, the vulnerability has increased uh, on the people. The majority of the family that we work uh, 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 in Orissa and elsewhere, a poor, dead migrant, unskilled, 
and driven out due to economic hardship and effect of natural disaster. The current study where uh, we have done in Kendrapada uh, is in the eastern part of uh, India, uh, the eastern Odisha, uh, uh, is experiencing a vulnerable, uh, like the people are more vulnerable to extreme weather conditions like cyclone, flood, and coastal erosion, which is really, which is displacing large number of people. Uh, and, and the Kendra Pada, where we have done this study, the seven villages, uh, which are known as Satbhaya in Oriya languages, the seven villages, uh, uh, which are submerged under the sea uh, because of the extreme uh, sea erosion, which has taken place. And uh, 571 families from these uh, villages were resettled by the government at the nearby places. Uh, uh, and, and probably I think uh, this is the first of its kind, I think 571 families are the first, uh, 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 the climate displaced people uh, in Orissa or you can say like the, the so-called, I think we say the climate refugees who had to be uh, 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 provided uh, some kind of resettlement uh, by the government. Um, and this is the case of the climate induced displacement which has taken place and also more to uh, uh, more to come. As we have around 800 kilometers of coastline, Orissa coast, and the various hotspots are also coming up uh, where uh, there's a need to uh, evacuate people urgently from the coast. I think we have uh, such places in other districts as well on the coastline. Uh, predominantly, the coastal villages in Kendrapada are hugely vulnerable to extreme weather, uh, the cyclone and flood. Uh, uh, as Ritu said, last two decades, Odisha has witnessed 10 deadly cyclones which hit the eastern coast of India, and 50% of the high intensity cyclone hit Odisha coast in the three years, last three years. You just imagine last three years, there are five uh, cyclones which has hit, and that was also during the COVID, which we had of two years of COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, so you can know the kind of the situation you have the COVID pandemic going on, uh, uh, the first uh, wave and the second wave, and you have three cyclones back to back hitting uh, Kendra Pada and all, all these areas. And uh, people have been migrating uh, from this area. And you know, as we all know, uh, there is no data. It's completely undocumented migrants. I think people are moving to different places. So the combined effect of uh, cyclone, flood, and sea erosion has devastated the lives of the people on the coastal region of Kendrapada and also at the neighboring uh, district. Uh, you, you know, this marine uh, incursion, uh, uh, I think, into the coastal habitation is a, is a, is a major issue, uh, which, which uh, and a huge concern for the government uh, even. Uh, and when we see that uh, the Kendrapada also have uh, uh, migration of uh, uh, worker, skilled worker, and we know the plumbers of uh, uh, those who are actually do the plumbing work, uh, they're, they're all over the world uh, from the place, the tiny district called Kendrapada. Uh, and uh, and uh, they remit huge money to the, to the district. But on the other hand, those who are living on the coast uh, and mostly unskilled migrant, uh, uh, and this migration trend is increasing now. More number of people are actually migrating. Uh, Basically, the failing livelihood opportunity uh, is pushing large number of people to various states for seasonal, semi-permanent employment. People are actually moving out. According to local people, around 80 to 90 percent of the household on the coastal region in, in the study area either has one or two member of their family working as migrant worker elsewhere uh, 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 in, in the country. Um, you know, uh, during COVID, uh, uh, we have witnessed the large influx of people. People started migrating back from the cities to the rural areas. And uh, uh, India has recorded around 10 million migrant workers who moved. Uh, uh, they walked back, uh, they cycled back, and they became uh, 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 back in a very distressed condition to the villages. And Orissa has reported around 1 million migrant workers who came from different uh, uh, states uh, and the different cities. And the Kendra Pada has reported around 60,000 migrant returnees who, who, who came back uh, during the COVID uh, uh, to, to various uh, villages in Kendra Pada. 
And this is the first time we have some data available uh, during the, the, the COVID time. At least we have some figures to tell, yeah, there are 60,000 migrants have come. But, but, but uh, within two years, many of these migrant workers have gone back uh, to, to their work. Uh, and we don't have data again. Uh, we are square one now. We don't know how many people have migrated after COVID. Uh, now, interestingly, you know, I think uh, after COVID, a regular bus service between Kerala in southwest coast, I think you can know the southwest coast and uh, uh, Kendrapad on the eastern coast covering 2,000 kilometers. Now you have a regular bus services now, uh, which is bringing migrant, uh, 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 which is taking migrant from Kendrapada and bringing back those who are uh, coming home, uh, is ferrying migrant workers from source and destination. The mobility is now more explicit and organized due to large number of middlemen and traffickers who operate to facilitate supply of laborer to Kerala and other, other southern states. Uh, during the study, some of the migrants have narrated their stories as how they were often uh, uh, like ill-treated, exploited at the work site, at the destination. Some, way, some went on to say as to how they were kept as a hostage uh, and the administration has to intervene uh, and, 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 and rescued all these people. Many also complain about overwork, like hours of work is happening because many of them are farmers. They're not tuned to the kind of work they do in the plywood industries and other industries, which is far away, around uh, 2,000 kilometers away from their villages. Uh, but another interesting thing that uh, we see that when men are migrating, men are moving out, the left behind uh, are, the, are, are the women, are the children, are the disabled, who are actually staying back. Uh, and that's, that is what we have been observing like uh, in, in another district uh, near Kendrapada, uh, it's, it's said that around six to 700,000 people have migrated. Even if 300,000 migrants uh, are the men, so you, you can imagine the women are managing uh, the household in a disaster-prone area. During their absence, I think you, they, they also face the kind of disaster. But also like we found of late, the people who are moving into Kerala, I think during the monsoon that many of them would also face floods in that area. So, you know, disaster is both at home and also like, you know, wherever they are going as a destination, the both the place they are also facing the same uh, the, the disaster. Uh, now, coming back to uh, some of the central laws which uh, regulate migrants, which, which provides uh, some kind of you know, uh, support to the migrant workers, is grossly violated. Uh, we have a, a central law called the Interstate Migrant Workers Act 1976, which is grossly violated and not being implemented or poorly implemented uh, uh, in various parts of India, uh, the destination as well as the source. The anti-trafficking laws and the enforcement is yet, uh, it's not adequately implemented. I think that is one area that a, a concern that large scale labor trafficking is happening, uh, but the understanding is something different, like you know, the trafficking uh, is, is, is understood only uh, for the sex work or the sex trade or for the commercial sex work. But the last scale, uh, the trafficking which is happening uh, uh, in India are the labor trafficking. Uh, we are still waiting for a comprehensive trafficking of person bill, which is still at the parliament. Uh, I think uh, it's last three years, uh, it has not been discussed. Uh, I, I hope in coming uh, sessions, uh, this law will be discussed. And, and, and uh, uh, I, I think we'll have a comprehensive law which will actually protect both uh, all the uh, migrant uh, and also the traffic victim. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. I'll stop there uh, uh, with that note. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, that was a that was a great presentation. Um, so this is for Johnson, uh, Johnson Topno. Uh, Ritu highlighted how climate change, uh, excuse me, climate induced trafficking uh, in Jakarn, Jakarn uh, is almost two and a half times more than in Odisha, um, Jharkhand, I think, if I pronounced that correctly. Uh, how are communities being forced into trafficking, uh, exploitative work conditions, and bonded labor situations due to climate change-induced drought? Uh, and uh, why do, the, do you think that these impacts uh, are more stark in your region? Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon. Uh, thank you, IID and FCDO. Thank you, Josh, for moderating this session. 
I would begin with a quote to respond to this question, Josh, uh, from a tribal uh, traditional leader uh, from Munda tribe called Padha Raja. He says, in the last 40 years, entire landscape has changed. Dense forest to scrub jungle, less biodiversity in terms of both flora and fauna in the area, medicinal plants have disappeared, social structure is changing every day, emergence of exploitative markets taking control of the household economy, women have to go far away places to fetch water, natural springs have dried up, people are getting trapped into high yielding varieties of crops with huge input cost against natural farming, sudden change in monsoon has reduced agriculture and minor forest produce productions every year. So I'm representing Jharkhand, which is uh, land of forest, which is known. And I represent FIA Foundation working very intensively on the migration and traffic for the past few years. And here people largely depend on agroforestry, livelihoods interactions, and which in the past ancestors have enjoyed much better than what they are enjoying. There has been a drastic change in climatic factors, which has led to distress migration, trafficking, unemployment, especially among the most vulnerable communities. When we are talking about vulnerable communities, I'm talking about scheduled tribes, scheduled caste, and especially primitive vulnerable tribal groups. Yes, migration is not bad, but distress migration and trafficking is bad. Lack of employment and vulnerability has led the poorest community from the community very vulnerable and getting into the vicious cycle of poverty. <clears throat> they don't have basic choices to live with dignity. And often they are living in the mercy of uh, employers, feudal lords in the existing social structure in the form of distress migration and trafficking. I agree that migration trafficking is much more in Jharkhand as compared to other parts of the country. And which is also very evident from the data source that we have from the state migrant control room which was managed by FIA Foundation on behalf of the Department of Labor and Employment, Training, Skill Development, Government of Jharkhand. During the lockdown, during COVID response, it was managed by FIA Foundation. And almost we have been able to get back home more than a million people who are standards in different parts of the country, uh, the neighboring country and within the state. And uh, we, during in the last uh, one and a half years, we have made uh, registration of the calls have been 0 0.94 million calls on various issues pertaining to a standard condition, delay payment, accidental death, atrocities, trafficking issues, etc. This also tells that migrant laborers, wherever they are working at the destinations, they are not safe and entire supply chain needs to be sanitized. And therefore, government of Jharkhand has already launched a uh, uh, very strategic intervention as safe and responsible migration initiative so that people are there and they are safe and they are being respected, acknowledged for the contribution they are making in the nation building. And it is being implemented by a consortium and we are doing that and FIA is one of the partners along with uh, PDAC, CMID, ISB supported by media. And now when we are talking about Palamu, which is a rain shadow area, and people uh, from the Bhuya community says that we have not achieved freedom despite being freed. This is the reality. The another uh, person, another woman from the same community, Bhuya community says that our lives were much prosperous before nothing would finish them. Means they lived in abundance, but you don't have. The issue here is that uh, the community from the uh, scheduled caste who are majorly landless and they complete, they don't even have the very decent homestead land, which Ritu has already spoken about it. And every household, all the adult men are migrating and because they don't have choices and they, they are forced to get into the traffic. And Jharkhand is known for trafficking instances largely among the tribal and scheduled caste community and majorly in the domestic workforce. They go to the uh, multinational uh, major cities, metropolitan cities as a domestic help. And some get trafficked into the different trades as well. The situation here is that uh, even in order to have a survival, 
because the agriculture is failing they don't have land they don't get the local employment in terms of the even in the agriculture fields so they are as part of the coping mechanisms they are even uh, depend on the forest landscape which is also i mean it is denuding every day and uh, often these community depend on the uh, they call it a madhu, uh, mahua tree mahua tree is basically madhuka indica where more than 6 months of their livelihood runs into these trees and which is also mortgage gauge uh, to the upper caste community and whatever they used to get it from these forest productions especially the uh, madhuka indica and other tubers and fiber fibers which are also being mortgage and uh, they are running the households like that. and often these communities migrate to a very different places like like the, the other speaker was talking about kerala where even i recently visited and i found that thousands of people are getting into the tea garden with the families with 10000 to 15000 rupees earning and uh, somehow they are managing their course there apart from that while looking at the entire segment of migration and trafficking what we have found the uh while we were managing the state migrant control room, we found that distress condition among women is much much higher they don't have choices the safety is compromised uh the payments are not done at the destination locations and so on and therefore one of the reasons is that a lot of efforts as far as the national schemes like mj and rj is supposed to be happening but delay in payments always again sends them back to the peripheries uh, not having confidence uh, that whether these programs are really going to benefit them something access to social security also gets uh, impacted because uh, the documentation the government requires is not in proper conditions and they will therefore direct cash transfer becomes difficult the the documentation in different certificates are differently documented and which does not match with the bank linkages and therefore they are deprived of getting access to social security in the same time and therefore the only survival that they they have is to get into the bondage kind of condition or migrate in a very distressed condition that's how the people are living here in jharkhand and it requires huge policy uh, framework to be designed so that even if their people are migrating they should be safe and uh, responsible in terms of the entire supply chains and so that they are they are able to support the family down and they have a better education better nutrition supply and so on so i end it here and if you have any questions i i i will be happy to respond thank you thank you josh over to you Uh thank you Johnson that was excellent. Um this one is for uh Devanshu uh and again uh, uh Devanshu Chakravarty is a researcher and independent consultant and uh, Devanshu we just listened to how climate uh uh is acting as a stress multiplier forcing communities to undertake in some cases very risky coping strategies that land them in um trafficking like situations. can you explain the underlying drivers that create these vulnerabilities uh thank you <clears throat> josh uh i think you have already said that climate change acts as a stress multiplier and for this current study we used a framework uh where we used five recognized drivers of uh, migration to look at the underlying uh, factors of both migration and Uh, trafficking so we looked at economic political uh, demographic social and environmental factors to understand the uh, the situation why migration and trafficking is uh, taking place now uh, we have to bear in mind that in kendrapara migration is a very recent phenomenon while in palamu there are evidences that people have been migrating for uh, more than 3 uh, centuries so uh, also we have to uh, understand that uh, kendrapara was a very fertile and prosperous region earlier it used to attract migrants but today the situation is different uh, livelihoods have become more vulnerable in the last few decades and this is more a result of the factors uh, or uh, as a result of climate change which has 
already been talked in detail about uh, by Ritu and I, uh, Umi Daniel. Uh, and uh, because the vulnerable, uh, the livelihoods are vulnerable in Kendrapara, migration from there also takes place. Uh, but as you heard from the earlier two presentations, you can see the, the kind of migration is also very different and the facilitating environment for migration is also very different. There are buses that are flying from uh, uh, Kendrapara to Kerala, whereas uh, we did not hear of similar experiences uh, in Alamo. So one of the factors that uh, drive uh, drives uh, uh, that we found uh, 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 that was driving migration and uh, human trafficking uh, uh, was food insecurity. This was highly uh, pronounced in Palamu, but it was also found to be the case in Kendrapara. So among our trafficked uh, uh, household families, 81 percent of the families in uh, uh, from uh, palamu uh, 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 shared that they were uh, actually suffering from uh, food insecurity they were taking just one meal per day the percentage was lower uh, in uh, um, jharkhand uh, uh, and uh, also there are economic drivers that uh, is impacting migration and uh, <coughs> human trafficking Debt is one of the factors that is impacting uh, that is impacting households in both locations. Uh, people are indebted to local moneylenders, and to repay uh, that, uh, they have to undertake uh, migration. Uh, some of the reasons for which the debt uh, was taken primarily uh, it was taken for healthcare purposes, for uh, repaying old debts, for agriculture, healthcare. Uh, these were few of the factors. Also, uh, when we look at the economic landscape or the livelihood landscape in the two regions, it is very different. Uh, it is agriculture and sea-based activities in Kendrapara, whereas it is agriculture and forest-based livelihoods in uh, Palamu. Both have been impacted by climate change, and uh, we see that there is migration from both these both these regions. Both these regions. Literacy is also an, an important factor. Uh, low levels of education hinder employment opportunities of youth uh, in sectors other than natural, resource, uh, natural resources. Kendrapara has got a higher literacy rate than Palamu. Uh, it is around 85% in Kendrapara and uh, around 63% in Palamu. Uh, the rates are much lower in among the PBTGs and uh, uh, SE communities in Palamu, uh, it's uh, lower than 50%. Now, uh, if you see the nature of uh, the, the vocations also taken up by youth are also different. Uh, many uh, uh, people in the urban areas from Kendrapara are employed as plumbers, uh, especially the youth. Whereas uh, Palamu contributes a large uh, population to the uh, construction industry. Uh, if you see, I think and Ritu has touched on it, Johnson has also touched on it, uh, that uh, there is a history of feudal exploitation and bonded labor in Palamu, of which we did not find any uh, evidence in uh, Kendrapara. In fact, from among the migrants also, we found that a high percentage of migrants from uh, Palamu were uh, from the uh, uh, tribal community, whereas uh, in Kendrapara, the SE community was only uh, was less than 10 percent. The uh, rest comprised mostly forward caste, that is the general caste or the OBC caste. So uh, social drivers are also an important factor that is uh, driving migration and human trafficking. Uh, uh, if we look at the status of uh, uh, infrastructure and uh, let us also say political drivers, uh, both uh, locations actually uh, reported that when they were not uh, aware of the existence of institutions that can actually be very helpful in their uh, uh, in addressing uh, uh, their uh, vulnerability to uh, migration uh, for example like gram sabhas village panchayats and village uh, ward sabhas there are in uh, kendrapara there were uh, village board level disaster management committees, but
but people were not the general public was not aware about what was the uh, composition of these committees where they were uh, when these meetings were held and the agenda was never ever discussed in the village gram sabhas uh, if you look at the infrastructure infrastructure was also um, existing in kendrapara to for uh, uh, addressing uh, uh, for i mean uh, helping people during cyclones but what we uh, found was that the infrastructure was not sufficient it was uh, uh, there was one center that was uh, present in the seven villages that we four in four villages seven of the four uh, four of the seven villages uh, the infrastructure was there but it was uh, shared to be inadequate uh, uh, while the road conditions were very good uh, or uh, uh, the connectivity was good in kendrapara uh, the connectivity was not at all very uh, not was very poor in uh, uh, in in uh, 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 palamu i'll not touch upon the climate drivers as everybody has already talked about that and how it has impacted life on this thing uh, social security programs also the access to social security programs was poor in both places ritu has already talked about uh, manrega so i will not going to get into detail about that but for other schemes also for example like uh, uh, the bocw card which is actually a labor registration card for construction workers we didn't find many people or uh, no no one from kendrapara uh, actually uh, registering um, uh, under this uh, uh, scheme or having this card and uh, in uh, palamu also there were few people who were uh, having access to this so uh, and in uh, kendrapara also we did not find anybody who had enrolled for any vocational training programs that were provided by the uh, government the coverage for insurance was also very low at 6% uh so in general uh, i mean access to social security schemes can actually help address uh, uh human tra trafficking and migration but uh, well, from what we found that both uh, on rapid onset and slow on uh, uh, onset context the social protection mechanism could not uh, absorb the climate uh, shocks or efficiently uh, cover all eligible households so this is what we found from our study Josh, uh, I'll be happy to take questions later. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Uh, very informative. Uh, so, Ritu, uh, well, I wanted to circle back to you for a minute. Uh, you know, we've heard about these issues and the challenges. Um, I, I'd like to come back to you uh, again and ask you what you think should be done uh, by the policymakers, in particular, to address this nexus between climate change, migration, and trafficking that's so evident from your research. Um, I was particularly struck, um, uh, for instance, by the fact that you said that there was no drought early warning system in India like there is for, for rapid onset crises like cyclones. So um, that seems like an obvious uh, place to, to, to look, but um, over to you and thank you. Uh, thanks, Josh. Uh, I believe like this issue is not unsurmountable, but what we really need is recognition of this issue. Uh, and a collective response from different levels of governance. So we probably need action from the local or the state level, national level, and international level. And I'll just quickly talk about what we need to do at each of these levels, especially, for example, if I talk about the local or the state level, the local government needs to focus. They need to focus on programs that support in situ adaptation uh, that can make agriculture, fishery, or forest-based livelihood more resilient to climate impacts and prevent distress migration. But I'm not saying that all of those impacts will be because they are with the increasing climate in climate impact intensity and frequency. Many of these impacts may be beyond the coping capacity. But at least let's try to undertake whatever in situ adaptation we can to make these impacts as less um, uh, disastrous for the communities as possible. Secondly, there's a need to shape policy interventions based on local knowledge and evidence, especially because we just saw that addressing risks to trafficking in a wide range of social contexts where it occurs requires need for inclusion of the affected communities in decision making and openness to local forms of resilience and adaptation. Uh, thirdly, I would say state governments need to ensure that all migrant workers are registered with the Labor Welfare Board uh, and use digital interface to track flow and status of migrants, where they're employed, and ensure compliance with workers' rights and entitlements. And state governments also need to in, you know, identify, because we, we heard from all the panelists that 
food insecurity becomes a big issue water insecurity becomes a big issue so let's identify some of these hotspots and try to ensure that social protection measures and doorstep delivery of some key services are ensured for those most vulnerable household uh, then again like a lot of panelists also mentioned about women and children particularly being exposed so uh, being more vulnerable so we need to ensure that we pay special attention on them especially to reduce economic vulnerability of women family members who are left behind and link them with entrepreneurial and other livelihood activities so that's what we can or the government can do at the at the local level or at the state level at the national level probably there is a need to recognize uh, and give priority to this issue in both development as well as climate policy and integrate these priorities and actions in climate resilience plan migration response plan as well as national development plan um, ndc the national determined contributions are something where the governments uh, talk about what action they are going to take on climate action there is a need to include trafficking in that uh, as well i i doubt india and i am not i'm sure india does not include trafficking either in the state climate change action plan or the national action plan so there is a need to recognize this as an issue and start at Uh, including that and addressing that there is also need to create a right based based framework uh, for climate risk management within the social protection program now these rights could be around access to appropriate shelter food grain decent job because if if communities have that right it can ensure that they have the safety le- safety net even when they face any crisis whether it's climate or covid or any other crisis Uh, and then again extend the portability of social protection employment and anticipate reaction as you mentioned in your opening comment that that could be a basic basic minimum action that government can take uh, have proper early warning system take anticipate reaction to move people to safety before a disaster strike or take anticipatory measures to help them and then finally i very quickly i'll touch upon what needs to be done at the international level and I, I, purely because i come from the climate change fraternity i would really urge that uh, and cecilia probably will second me on that that we need firm targets and action to be considered within the unfccc mechanism uh, along the lines of sustainable development goal a uh, task force on displacement has been created in line with the paris agreement but this tfd this task force on displacement needs to recognize this nexus issue of climate migration with trafficking there is also a need for coordinated international effort rooted in the existing initiative we know there are a lot of existing international uh, uh, mechanism for example task force on displacement sustainable development goals sendai framework nansen initiatives and so on but each of these issues they are quite scattered across several sectors and actors there's a need of a more joined up and an inclusive approach that complements and draws upon the work of existing bodies and expert group um so i'll just stop there uh, josh and i know i probably we have gone over time so uh, over back to you oh no that was excellent i think that's very important um and so i wanted to uh I th- did my did my picture disappear here for a second um but uh um yeah i i i wanted to thank you for that uh, one thing that i'd like to do um is make a plug for uh for journalists in this i mean i think that um you know journalists can play a very key role um in what's happening um and um you know uh, i'm an advisor uh for i wanted to give a shout out to uh, the, uh, the journalism center on global trafficking where i'm an advisor uh and a special thanks to kara tabachnik for founding and directing this group because i think that it's really important for journalists to help uh train a spotlight on these issues um and uh helping train journalists uh in countries like india bangladesh and so forth um uh so that they can help inform uh the you know the public's understanding of human labor arms drugs and wildlife trafficking uh and particularly emerging issues like this uh slow versus rapid onset uh of climate change and how that's affecting human trafficking so um you know hopefully we can raise some awareness of this and help train the journalists so that they can help uh you know uh inform the public of what's happening um so at that point we do uh i wanted to um uh i guess we don't we don't have time for questions 
Uh, but I would like to get some closing comments from our keynote speakers and some other speakers. Um, so I, first, I would love to invite uh, Siobhan Malali of the UN Special Rapporteur on Trafficking in Persons to share some closing comments on the findings shared by the panelists and what action you think the UN uh, should be doing to address these issues. Um, thank you very much, Josh, and thank you very much to all of the, the speakers and panelists. Um, I think the key points have been made, um, and my concern is really to try to move forward based on the recommendations in this report and the contributions that we've heard here today. Um, particularly, I think it's important in terms of looking at um, UN action or state-led uh, actions uh, or other um, programs at an international level that we break down the silos between the um, responses in relation to environmental degradation uh, and climate change and the focus on human rights, just transitions and safe open migration, as well as human rights based approaches to, to combat trafficking. So rather than working in fragmented ways that we ensure that these concerns are integrated and addressed in the more traditional climate or environmental settings, if you like. And I think this event today is a very good example of that, um, being led by the IIED as an Institute on Environment and Development, but looking specifically at the concerns in relation to forced migration and displacement and increased risks of trafficking in persons. So I think it's hugely important that the evidence that we've heard today the empirical data, the case studies, that these are brought to the attention of international actors and to states, and that the recommendations in the report are integrated uh, into the ongoing work of different uh, platforms, the upcoming COP uh, and other arenas where we can really try to push forward on implementation of the recommendations and prevention of trafficking in persons being built into climate adaptation and mitigation strategies. So thank you very much. And as I said, through my mandate uh, as Special Rapporteur, I'm very happy to continue to work with you and to find opportunities to collaborate and hopefully to strengthen our work. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I'd also, I, I'd like to now invite Cecilia Silva Bernardo, uh, climate negotiator for the LDCs to share some closing comments as well uh, on the findings uh, shared by the panelists. Um, and what do you think are the key takeaways for you, uh, particularly from the perspective of developing countries' vulnerability uh, to climate change? Thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. Um, it was a, a very good, very good uh, um, um, points from panelists. Um, I will be brief for the sake of time. Ritus have made very good remarks that I will not repeat some of, of them, but... Uh, um, I think it, uh, it's important. Uh, we should consider that despite everything, the international policy discourse is still debating about the causal link between climate, migration and trafficking. Um, we have uh, to see findings shared today by the panelists as, uh, as a stark reminder that we can no longer afford to turn a blind eye to the issue of nexus on this issue. Um, this climate-induced distress, migration, and displacement is delaying the development of the society and community in LDCs. That's uh, a fact. Um, and it's done by increasing pressure on urban infrastructure and services, by undermining economic growth, by increasing the risk of conflict, and by leading towards health, educational, and social indicators among migrants. Uh, Joshua, I also, Josh, I also think there is the urgent need of having social support systems that have uh, the reach to most vulnerable communities and households with automated triggers to support with slow onset, event, onset events like drought or fast onset events like uh, floods. And of course, it's important to, to also um, pay attention and consider um the 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 gender the gender aspect when dealing with these issues as women are left behind to manage their families as men migrate looking for work i believe there is the need to support 
for the support to be particularly focused on the needs of women in the least developed and most affected communities. I thank you, Josh. I will stop here um, for the sake of time and to give opportunity to others to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cecilia. So I would like to now invite Daljeet Kaur uh, from the Climate and Environment Advisor for the uh, FCDO, the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, to share some closing comments. Um, uh, and, you know, the UK government supported this research. Um, and so I would, of course, like to ask you what your takeaways are from the research and how, how do you plan to take these findings forward? Thank you, George. Uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. And uh, firstly, thank you to the panelists for a very enriching and insightful discussion. Uh, we all recognize the importance of best available evidence and science for effective climate action and policy making. Uh, evidence shared by the panelists just now suggests that climate induced migration intersects with severe form of exploitation. While the evidence is clear, it is critical now to use this to inform our development plans and ensure that uh, climate action gets integrated across all sectors to reduce intrinsic and acquired vulnerabilities of people, environment, and economies. Um, we heard uh, earlier Ritu talk about one of the study areas uh, with, uh, which experiences higher frequency of cyclones and flooding, uh, coupled with sea level rise and seawater in, uh, intrusion as well that actually damages livelihood assets, soil uh, erosion, and land degradation. While an uh, efficient social protection cover might potentially enhance people's absorptive and adaptive capacities, most of these uh, social protection programs are not designed to anticipate climate shocks, and thus they fail to provide a holistic safety net. Therefore, uh, these social protection programs may need to be reinvented uh, and uh, they should explicitly include climate considerations in their design and delivery. Mm. Infrastructure for climate resilient growth is one such program that I'm delivering with Government of India and our partners like IIED, UNDP and FIA Foundation, who you uh, also saw in the panel today. Uh, this ICRG program, uh, uh, this is an FCDO program, it's a TA program, it demonstrates how well-designed programs within the framework of social protection offer a pathway uh, to local economic growth, inclusion, and also contribute towards long-term climate resilience for the most vulnerable community. Uh, so in line with, uh, with our work under the ICRG program and this research, I would like to highlight uh, three action um, uh, points, particularly today, that need to be taken to help reduce extreme vulnerabilities that force people uh, into migration and push, push them further into poverty and bondage. Uh, so the first one is to improve the outreach of social protection program. We've heard the panelists talk about that in length. Uh, the second one is to integ integrate trafficking issues into the nationally determined contributions, the NDCs and ensure climate finance commitments are made uh, on these issues. And lastly, the policy should be de designed on the back of local level research and evidence, such as uh, the one that we've heard today, uh, because empirical evidence can help develop need-based and area-specific policies that address climate change uh, driven displacements. Uh, I will end here and I would thank you, uh, uh, thank you to Josh, and I'll pass it on to Anirban. Thank you very much. Uh, so in closing, I would like to finally invite uh, Anirban Ganguly, uh, South Asia Research Hub uh, under FCDO uh, to share some of the next steps. Um, and I wanted to thank everybody for participating in this uh, excellent uh, panel discussion uh, and especially those who did the report. Uh, it's really groundbreaking work and I hope it gets all the attention it, and, and response that it deserves. So uh, over to you, Anirban. Thanks very much, Josh. Um, I had jotted down some points, honestly, for um, the closing remarks and next steps, but I believe that most of that has already been said uh, in the discussion today. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, I think the study um, that was presented today is uh, timely. Uh, especially because it comes a few months uh, after the COP26 commitments have been made, uh, which makes a special case 
I would say, for stepping up adaptation effort vis-a-vis -vis mitigation. But equally, the IPCC Working Group 2 report is out focusing on impacts. It makes numerous references to the climate-induced migration. I think the study is um, significant because it uh, tries to fill critical evidence gap. We know that these links exist, but uh, there is limited empirical data to um, um, say with confidence what the evidence means in practice. And I say this because um, even the IPCC Working Group report makes uh, numerous references, but they also um, uh, attach a medium confidence tag to most of these references, which perhaps means that um, much more uh, needs to be done to establish empirically uh, the links which we know notionally. So to that extent, I think the study is particularly relevant and significant. I would also say that some of the statements uh, and observations that were made are actually quite thought provoking. And if I may use the term provocative, for example, Ritu's comment that um, uh, an area which is marked by slow onset changes actually has much uh, higher numbers of um, trafficked migrants uh, than an area with um, in, uh, in the slow onset, uh, fast onset, the cyclone prone areas, which is um, uh, quite honestly a bit counterintuitive. And it's indeed thought provoking because much of the attention that uh, goes to adaptation planning tend to focus on cyclones and those extreme events. It's important that uh, such uh, empirical observations are placed in the public domain so that we can um, look forward to uh, more uh, attention to these slow onset events and its consequences. Now, in terms of uh, the next steps, mm, I would say that, um, I mean, I was told, and I'm sure um, it's great that uh, today in this virtual room, we have as many as 400 participants, which is fantastic. But um, I do think that we need to take um, uh, the report uh, to a much larger audience, to the entire community of uh, climate researchers, climate policy makers, academics, uh, government, international bodies, and so on. And I entirely agree with Josh when you say that there's really a plug for the journalists, because I think um, the media and indeed the social media as well would have an important role to make sure that uh, research of this nature gets its uh, due credit in the world of science and policy. Uh, but also I think equally that um, the point that Ritu also made in her last intervention, um, it's important that policy makers are made insiders to this process. Um, we need to take this uh, out to policy makers at uh, the level of uh, national governments uh, at the level of uh, global policy makers and the entire uh, policy making community, wherever uh, they operate from, simply because um, while um, it's true that we need more of data and reports uh, of this nature uh, fill crucial data gaps, uh, policy making can't really wait for all data to come in. So it's important to take forward the conclusions of the report, the findings, the recommendations. Uh, when um, IID and partners say that it's important that social protection schemes uh, need to be made an integral part of adaptation action. I think it's an important policy message that we all need to imbibe and take forward. Uh, finally, I think um, uh, it's important to also note that a report of this kind um, doesn't end with a launch event such as this. There are questions that still uh, need to be answered. There are dimensions of the problem that needs to be addressed. For example, I would say uh, cross-boundary uh, climate-induced migration and the geopolitics of that is something that needs to be looked at in more detail, building up from some of the observations uh, that were made today. So there's indeed lots to do. But um, honestly, um, I must say that uh, this is a report which um, it had promised 
empirical compelling evidence on an issue which uh, affects uh, the entire globe in a way and uh, the report does a commendable job in uh, addressing that issue so i would like to end here um, in the interest of time uh, i'm not doing a formal uh, thank you but um, thanks to all the panelists thanks to the research team thanks to the presenters uh, thanks to thanks to you josh for moderating and um, and uh, thanks a ton to uh, all the participants in today's uh, virtual room. Uh, please be with us uh, in this journey. It was great to um, have all of you today. I hope we'll meet again. Thank you very much.